Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. Today, the book I will interpret for you is the novel The Tree of Man. The title itself is symbolic, representing the history of human exploration, which is like the continuity of a tree, generation after generation, never-ending. The Tree of Man tells the story of two generations of a family spanning several decades. The protagonist of the novel is named Stan Parker, an Australian pioneer. The entire book revolves around his life, describing how he and his wife embarked on a pioneering venture in the jungle, raised children, and faced various natural disasters and man-made calamities until his death. The author of the novel is Patrick White, the first Australian Nobel laureate in literature. The Nobel Committee praised him, saying that through his epic narrative style and portrayal of characters' psychological depth, he brought Australian literature to the world stage. White's literary achievements are inseparable from his unique artistic style. Although he is an Australian and the novel's backdrop is mostly Australia, his creative style is not limited to the local context but has a broader universal appeal. For example, while traditional Australian literature focuses on conflicts between individuals and the external world or conflicts between people, White is more concerned about individuals and their inner worlds. He expands the themes of Australian literature to the realm of the spiritual. It can be said that White is a monument in the history of Australian literature, and in his career, the first significant monument is the book we are interpreting today. The Tree of Man White began writing this work in 1950, and after its publication in 1955, it immediately sparked a great response in the European and American literary circles. He blended the reality of Australia at that time with modernist literary techniques, portraying the spiritual crisis of the people in Australian society after World War II through the story of the Parker family. Despite economic prosperity and material abundance, people's spiritual worlds were desolate, living empty and dull lives, and interpersonal relationships became cold and distant. White not only depicted this spiritual crisis but also pondered how to overcome it. Concern for the spiritual pursuit of individuals and the exploration of their inner worlds are among White's fundamental themes. The characters in his works are always searching for the meaning and value of life, seeking the essence of existence. These significant existential questions may never have definitive answers, but that does not prevent us from contemplating, attempting to solve them, and gaining something from the process. White dedicated his life to exploring these questions and his reflections are worth our understanding today. Today's interpretation consists of three parts. In the first part, we will briefly learn about White's life and the background in which he wrote The Tree of Man. In the second part, we will delve into the main storyline of the novel. And in the third part, through the Parker family, we will gain a specific understanding of the spiritual crisis depicted in The Tree of Man and how White suggests we can overcome it. Part 1 we know that White is Australian, but what sets him apart from his peers is that he shuttled between England and Australia from a young age. In 1912, White was born in England and brought back to Australia at six months old. His parents came from affluent Australian farming families. During his childhood, White spent his early years on a farm in Sydney. He had a love for literature from a young age reading Shakespeare's plays at the age of nine, and even writing his own script at ten. In his teens, White went to England to receive a public school education and returned to Australia a few years later. During his university years, he went to England again to study modern languages at Cambridge University. During his university years, White's life was rich and diverse. He began writing poetry and published a collection of poems. He read extensively from British, French, and German literary works and was influenced by modern writers like Joyce and D. H. Lawrence. At the same time, he traveled throughout Europe, exploring the cultures of various countries. During World War II, he even worked for the Royal Air Force Intelligence Department. Around 1940, White published two novels, which, although not gaining much attention in the literary world, to some extent laid the foundation for his literary path. In 1948, White returned to his homeland, Australia, to settle down. 
Initially, he managed a farm, growing flowers and vegetables, and lived a farming life. However, he later decided to focus full-time on writing. He explained this transition in his autobiographical essay, Flaws in the Glass, where he realized that upon returning to his homeland, the material life of Australians had become richer, but spiritually it was pale. In the essay, he said, there stretches all around the great void of Australia, where thoughts are most vacant, where wealth is the important thing, where teachers and journalists rule the spiritual domain, where beautiful young men and women look at life through eyes without judgment. Seeing people living empty and dull lives, he involuntarily began conceptualizing the Tree of Man. In 1955, The Tree of Man was published, recognized as White's first classic work, marking his maturity in themes and style. Afterward, White entered the peak of his literary career, publishing several works, including The Eye of the Storm. It is worth mentioning that besides his literary writing, he was also an active social activist, supporting the rights of Aboriginal Australians, opposing nuclear weapons, and emphasizing environmental protection. In 1973, White was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. White gained significant attention in the literary circles of Europe and America, but he faced indifference in his homeland. For a long time, his works in Australia were met with mixed reviews and even overlooked. Many local critics didn't quite understand what his works were trying to convey. When The Tree of Man was published, most people were unaware that the author had already been living in Sydney for several years, and his works were scarce in bookstores. This cold reception persisted until the 1960s, when it began to improve. Why did this happen? One reason is White's personality. He was outspoken and made some controversial statements, which drew criticism from public opinion. His attitude towards the literary and academic circles was never quite friendly. For example, he would refuse to attend seminars and decline honorary degrees. He also opposed external interpretations of his works. However, the main reason was White's unique writing style, especially in terms of themes and language, which challenged the traditional norms of Australian literature at the time. In the 1940s and 1950s, traditional realism was the dominant force in Australian literature. The main themes revolved around the conflicts between people and nature or between individuals. In contrast, White wanted to delve into the human spiritual world in his works. In terms of language, most Australian writers adhered to the tradition of realism, using a journalistic style. However, White extensively employed modernist writing techniques such as stream of consciousness, symbolism, and irony in his works, blending the narrative of the story and the inner world of the characters. These techniques allowed White to develop a narrative art that depicts the psychology of characters. His works had depth and philosophical thoughts, which were lacking in the Australian literary scene at the time. However, as time passed and people gained a deeper understanding of White, Critics began to acknowledge his literary achievements, and his position in Australian literary history gradually solidified. Returning to The Tree of Man, let's examine the background in which White created this work. In the novel, the dwelling place of the protagonist, the Stan family, gradually transforms from wilderness to a small town. During the time White was writing The Tree of Man, Australia was undergoing demographic changes with a large number of rural residents moving to towns, leading to shifts in societal attitudes. In the 1950s, there was a prevalent Australian dream in society, where people aspired to have their own houses, cars, and live prosperous lives. However, White saw that behind this material prosperity, there was emptiness in people's spiritual world, and relationships between individuals became fake and indifferent. The prevailing atmosphere emphasized materialism. He wanted to use the tree of man to remind people that a simple and authentic life is the fundamental pursuit, and material desires are not worth chasing. In his autobiographical essay, Flaws in the Glass, White also mentioned his motivation for writing the tree of man. I tried to encompass every aspect of life in the book through the lives of an ordinary man and woman. But at the same time, I wanted to discover the extraordinary behind the ordinary, to find the mysterious and poetic. 
because it is all of this that makes these people's lives, including my own life since returning, bearable. Part 2. We delve into the story of the Tree of Man. The protagonist, Stan Parker, was born in an ordinary small town in Australia. His father was a blacksmith and had a drinking problem. His mother was a teacher who hoped Stan would become a missionary or follow in her footsteps as an educator, but Stan was not interested. After the death of his parents, Stan arrived at a piece of barren land he inherited, intending to start a new life. This desolate land was known as Parker's Place, and Stan cleared a space in the jungle and built a small house. Later, while visiting the city, he met his wife Amy and brought her back with him. The couple established a small farm on the barren land, growing vegetables and raising cows. As the farm grew, people started to settle in the area, and gradually it became a small village. Even wealthy individuals built villas there. During this time, Stan and Amy's life was peaceful, with the only regret being their inability to have children. Amy tried several times to conceive but was unsuccessful. In a particular year during the rainy season, heavy rainstorms occurred one after another, causing flooding in nearby towns. Stan joined others in providing disaster relief. There, he witnessed the devastating plight of refugees who had lost their homes and saw many people perish in the floods. Meanwhile, Amy and a neighbor's wife embarked on a journey to find their husbands and encountered a homeless young boy along the way. Amy wanted to adopt him and brought him back to the farm but the boy left after only one night. After the flood, the couple returned to their daily routine of laborious work. Since the flood, nobody knew why, but the village where Stan's family resided suddenly acquired an official name, Duralda. It was said to mean abundance. The once Parker's place gradually transformed into a modest modern village with various infrastructures such as a grocery store, post office, and more. In traditional Australian pioneering novels, the storyline would typically shift to depict the resilience and optimism of pioneers in the wilderness and the hardships of pioneering life. However, in The Tree of Man, the author, White, paid more attention to the different spiritual pursuits of the novel's characters. Initially, Stan and Amy resembled Adam and Eve in the wilderness, relying on each other in an environment lacking in material wealth and civilization. During this period, their relationship was intimate, like blocks of wood tossed into the air, cleanly and effortlessly falling into each other's embrace. However, as their lives became more prosperous, they developed different emotional connections to the land, and their relationship started to change. Stan grew even closer to nature, being deeply drawn to the wilderness's mysteries and uncontrollable aspects. Amidst their daily toil, he unconsciously sought a vague meaning. While Amy also sensed the creative force of nature, she preferred to rely on things she could understand and control, such as crops, cows, and buildings. These tangible elements reassured her that the land beneath her feet was her home. This difference in mindset gradually created cracks in their relationship. After their child was born, the fissure between the couple became even more apparent. Amy gave birth to a son named Ray and a daughter named Selma. Ray was naturally mischievous, while Selma was fragile and obedient from a young age. Compared to her daughter, Amy favored her son more. She had a strong possessiveness when it came to emotions, projecting all the love she didn't receive from her husband onto her children. Gradually, the role of a mother overwhelmed and even overshadowed her role as a wife. Amy's daily life was consumed by her children, in addition to managing the farm. Exhausted from her busy schedule, she started to feel self-pity and even suspected that her husband was avoiding her. To some extent, it was her possessiveness towards the children that pushed her husband away. Perhaps seeking an escape from daily life, Amy became attracted to a woman named Madeline. Madeline was young, beautiful, and had traveled to various countries. She was known as a socialite and was engaged to a wealthy young man. She frequently rode horses near Amy's home. Amy envied Madeline's wealth and elegance and would often project her own romantic fantasies onto Madeline. Amy's possessiveness towards her children gradually pushed Stan to the edge of the family. 
While Stan loved their children, he didn't know how to connect with them. He increasingly failed to understand Amy, as she seemed like a mysterious and inscrutable stranger. During their work on the farm, Stan occasionally felt a desire to be close to his wife, but this desire quickly disappeared because Stan felt that in broad daylight, the importance of his wife diminished. The relationship between Stan and Amy grew distant, and in this household, he became an outsider. However, Stan felt a sense of rebirth due to a thunderstorm. One night, Stan sat alone outside, feeling relaxed and at ease in the darkness as he awaited a thunderstorm. Lightning illuminated the night sky, thunder roared, and Stan breathed in the moist air, his skin greedily soaking up the rainwater like parched earth. The storm grew stronger, and in the face of nature's might, Stan experienced his own insignificance and humility. Lightning struck relentlessly, seemingly splitting open his soul. He humbly sought shelter from the rain beneath the porch, gripping a pillar, and he fell in love with this tumultuous world once again. After the storm, Stan's spiritual world and the people around him were noticeably different. Money and material possessions were no longer of utmost importance to him because he realized that in the face of the power of nature, all human activities were so insignificant. As a result, Stan's spiritual world gradually contrasted with those around him. Summer arrived, and a wildfire caused by a drought spread from a distance. Local residents attempted to stop the fire from destroying their homes. Initially, the firefighting efforts went smoothly, but in an instant, the fire advanced towards the mansions of the wealthy farmers. The blaze became unstoppable, and people were awestruck by its power, gathering nearby to watch. Amy noticed that Madeline was not among the crowd trying to escape, and she demanded that her husband save her. Madeline was rescued, but her hair was completely burned off by the fire. Finally, a heavy rain extinguished the wildfire, and on the surface, rural life returned to calm. However, the turbulent undercurrents of modern capitalist society were inevitably approaching. Shortly after the fire, the First World War broke out, and Stan enlisted in the military while Amy stayed in their hometown, taking care of the children. The small town they lived in, Duryurge, was far from the battlefield and wasn't greatly affected. After the war, Stan returned, and the family's life continued. Through managing the farm, the couple became more prosperous, and they bought a car. The second generation of the Stan family gradually grew up, but they all chose to leave their hometown and pursue opportunities in the city. Ray, the mischievous troublemaker, grew up to be willful and disobedient. His father sent him to the city to become an apprentice, but he didn't want to be an ordinary craftsman, so he ran away to the East Coast, seeking a better path for himself. Shortly after, his sister Selma also left home and went to Sydney to attend a women's business school. She studied diligently and found a job as a secretary after graduation. The longer she stayed in the city, the more distant she became from her parents. Sometimes she would miss her hometown, but she wanted to escape her rural background. Selma often attended concerts because it gave her a sense of superiority, making her feel like she belonged to the upper class. Ray briefly returned to the city, but he didn't focus on his work, idling around all day and engaging in illegal activities. One time, he tampered with a horse race. Stan received the news and came to the city to find his son, but Ray had already vanished. Ray's departure didn't have any impact on Selma. She had long decided to distance herself from him. She worked and lived in the city in an orderly manner, eventually becoming a lawyer's wife, leading the long-desired life of the middle class. However, she felt a deep emptiness inside, lacking true intimacy and understanding with her husband. On the other hand, Ray wandered around outside with the money his mother gave him, then returned to the city, got married, and had children. After marriage, he got involved with a prostitute and fathered an illegitimate child. Eventually, Ray was shot dead for unknown reasons in a nightclub. What was the life of the stand couple like after their children left home? Although they still lived together, the divide between them grew deeper. Ray's departure dealt a heavy blow to Amy, but she couldn't express her distress to her husband, so she engaged in an extramarital affair, 
despite finding no solace in it. Stan knew of his wife's infidelity but chose to turn a blind eye. This couple lived a life of shared bed but separate dreams. As they grew older, they struggled to manage the farm and eventually sold the land and livestock. At this point, Duryurge had unknowingly become permeated by the marks of a commercial society. In the face of the land he had cultivated his entire life, Stan often felt confused, unsure of what else he could pursue. To find solace, he and his wife would also go to church to pray, but neither of them found comfort in it. When news of their son's death reached them, the elderly couple sank into immense emptiness. Stan suffered a stroke, and his health rapidly declined. On the day he passed away, he encountered a young passing missionary who incessantly preached to him and asked, Perhaps you don't believe in God? Stan became annoyed and spat on the ground, saying, This is God. The missionary left, but Stan continued to stare at the spit on the ground. Suddenly, he felt a tremendous tenderness that understood everything welling up from within his chest. The most obscure and repulsive things in life instantly became clear. He had a great epiphany. Shortly after, he bid farewell to this world. On the morning of Stan's funeral, his grandson walked into the woods and gazed at the land that had witnessed Stan's entire life. His grandfather's axe had once cleared the boundary between the clearing and the jungle, but imperceptibly, that boundary had become blurred again. A poem of life surged in the child's heart, and he thought that one day he would write this poem of life. The boy lowered his head and walked through the trees. His slender body was growing robust, and the green, tender shoots of thought were unfolding. Hence, ultimately, there is no definitive end. The novel ends here, with White implying that the exploration of life and self by humanity is like an endless succession of trees, one generation after another. Part 3 The story plot of the Tree of Man ends here. We know that White portrayed the spiritual crisis of modern Australians through this work. In this final section, we will specifically examine this spiritual crisis through the Stan family and explore how, in White's view, it can be overcome. To some extent, all three members of Stan's family are trapped by material desires. Take Amy, for example. In the early years of their marriage, she was close to Stan, and they were each other's world but compared to spiritual pursuits, she cared more about worldly things. For instance, someone once stayed overnight at their house and left without a word, and Amy thought that person took a small silver tool called a silver polisher from their home. Stan believed that the item was useless, but Amy was angry because it was something she took pride in. Many years later, Amy found the silver polisher near their home, and she was delighted, while Stan had completely forgotten about the tool. This silver polisher highlights the difference in their perspectives. Amy also has various unrealistic fantasies about reality and often projects them onto the character of Madeline. When she sees Madeline riding a horse, she imagines herself sitting on the horse's back, living a wealthy and elegant upper-class life. Since her introduction in the novel, Madeline has been an object of scrutiny and objectification. Her luxurious appearance and extensive travels symbolize wealth in the eyes of the rural neighbors, and even her husband's family sees Madeline only as a socialite. However, when Madeline's hair is burned off in a fire and she vomits on the lawn, her allure fades in Amy's and others' hearts. Amy is lost in a world of materialism and fantasy, and her two children, after venturing into the city, have lost their innocence and sincerity, becoming slaves to money and desire. Her son, Ray, becomes selfish and irresponsible in his pursuit of money, leading a life filled with deceit and violence, ultimately dying at the hands of others. Her daughter, Selma, treats material possessions as her ultimate pursuit, putting great effort into escaping her rural background and yearning for upper-class society. She eventually becomes part of that society but finds herself without genuine friends and spiritually empty. At first glance, the fates of these siblings seem different, but in reality, they are both ensnared by the modern urban life and trapped by money and materialism. Their individual uniqueness has been worn away by the colossal machinery of modern cities. The small town of Duralgi, where the Stan family resides, is actually a microcosm of Australian society at the time. 
economic prosperity brought comfort to life but also caused changes in people's thoughts and values, casting a shadow over human relationships. All three members of the family are trapped in material desires, and their spiritual worlds are empty, while Stan dedicates his entire life to exploring his spiritual realm. Stan spends his entire life toiling in the jungle, with a reserved personality that keeps him closed off. However, he possesses a rich and sensitive inner world, constantly exploring the meaning of existence. In other words, for Stan, the essence of life does not lie in the material desires of the real world but in the exploration of the spiritual realm. To portray the complex inner world of Stan, White employs literary techniques such as symbolism and stream of consciousness, allowing us to witness Stan's search for the meaning of life. Speaking of symbolism, we know that symbolism refers to the use of concrete objects to represent specific abstract meanings, drawing readers' attention from the external world into the character's inner world. In this novel, White extensively utilizes symbolism. For example, Stan spends his entire life clearing the jungle, which symbolizes his lifelong endeavor to cultivate his inner world. Another recurring symbol is the storm. As we learned earlier in the plot summary, Stan experiences a rebirth through a storm, realizing his insignificance in the face of nature. From then on, money and material possessions are no longer of paramount importance to him. Before encountering the young missionary, the backyard lawn where Stan resides is depicted as a circular pattern centered around him, resembling a sacred ground. The garden, trees, vegetable patch, rural villa, bare land, and even the sky gradually envelop Stan, forming a grand celestial diagram with him at the center. White writes this way not to portray Stan as a sudden enlightened or godlike figure. He firmly believes that the pursuit of meaning by individuals should not belong to any delusion or specific spiritual system but rather stem from each person's process of self-awareness and self-questioning. From Stan's arrival in the wilderness to establish his spiritual home, his exploration within it, and ultimately his attainment of fulfillment, this process was not achieved overnight but filled with hardships and doubts. Throughout Stan's life, he experienced floods, droughts, fires, wars, as well as his wife's betrayal and his son's death. His spiritual perplexity was immense, but none of this made him give up on introspection. Instead, it made him more humble, more pure, and ultimately spiritually fulfilled. This outcome reflects one of White's viewpoints. The state of simplicity and humility is the only ideal state for humans. Only by consciously enduring hardships and constantly questioning the soul can humans approach this ideal state. This is also his answer to how to overcome spiritual crises. Finally, let's return to the title of the novel. We know that the tree of man symbolizes the continuous reproduction of humanity, but it also foreshadows the intertwined fate between humans and nature. In the novel, White uses a great deal of description to portray various extreme weather phenomena, allowing us to see that excessive human activities lead to ecological imbalance which in turn triggers nature's backlash. In the novel, the development of industrial technology brings convenience to the local residents of Durilji, but along with it comes the destruction of their living environment. It starts with dust flying and yellow sand spreading, followed by years of drought, dried up riverbeds, and patches of withered shrubs. The successive occurrences of storms, floods, and wildfires are essentially nature's protests. In the novel, the passive responses of people to these extreme weather phenomena indirectly reflect the limitations of human power. Faced with various natural disasters, although the villagers of Durilji help each other and seek a way to survive together, they cannot make the floodwaters recede or extinguish the wildfires. These descriptions in the novel reflect White's concern for ecological order and ecological crises. In his view, the grandeur and mystery of nature far surpass human imagination, and human power cannot surpass nature. The solution to ecological crises and the path to harmonious coexistence with nature may be hidden in Stan's life, returning to nature, getting closer to nature, and revering nature. All right, that's the essence of the tree of man interpreted for you. Let's recap today's content. 1. Patrick White, the author of The Tree of Man, 
was the first Australian Nobel laureate in literature. He broke through the realistic tradition of Australian literature at that time and brought modernist literature to this continent. Published in 1955, The Tree of Man is White's breakthrough and representative work. The novel revolves around the life of the protagonist, Stan Parker, and through the story of Stan's family, it portrays the spiritual crisis of people in Australian society after World War II. 2. Traditional Australian pioneering novels mainly depict humans as conquerors of nature, while The Tree of Man focuses more on the characters' different pursuits of the spiritual world. Stan loves nature and spends his life exploring the meaning of life. Amy is lost in the secular and fantastical world. Ray and Selma, after entering the city, become slaves to money and desire, with their spiritual world extremely empty. In order to depict the characters' inner world and their exploration of the spiritual world, White employs techniques such as symbolism and stream of consciousness in the novel. 3. Through this novel, White showcases the individual alienation caused by urbanization in Australian modern society. He wants to remind people through the tree of man that a simple and sincere life is the fundamental pursuit for humans, and material desires are not worth pursuing. At the same time, he uses Duroji as a microcosm of human society to show us the consequences of ecological imbalance, which are beyond human control. Ecological crises are also issues that modern people are collectively facing, and White's views on ecological problems are still worth pondering and learning from today. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.